Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. Today we're going to take a look at this cheaper handheld. It is called the R36S. And right off the bat, let's get the price out of the way. This thing is around $40 on AliExpress and you can often find it cheaper. And I've actually had this device and its predecessor on my radar for quite some time, but I wasn't ready to make a video on it until right now. And I have to say that over the past week of testing this handheld, I've been thoroughly impressed, especially at this price point. In fact, I'm confident in saying that at $40, I don't think you'll find anything better on the market right now. So in this video, we're going to talk about what this device is and what it can do and how we got here in the first place. And I think this will be a fun little dive into the history and progress of the retro handheld community. And so without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive right in. Okay, to start, I wanna talk about how we got here in the first place, and none of this would be possible without this device right here, which is called the Odroid Go Advance. Now, this device first came out in early 2020, right before the pandemic started. And this is made by a company named Hard Kernel out of South Korea. Now, this device came out before I even owned a retro handheld, but all the same, I did pick one of these up a couple years ago on sale. But to be honest, I've never actually taken it out of its box until today, and so I think this video is a pretty fitting place to do that. Now, one of the things that made the OG such a unique device is that it actually arrived unassembled. And so if you wanted to buy this device, you had to put it together yourself. Now they include all the tools that you would need. And so it kind of turns into like an adult sized Lego project instead. And for me, I've been waiting for a rainy day so that I can put this thing together. But as you can imagine with a busy YouTube channel, I never actually have a quiet rainy day. So this will just be a project that I will save for later. One thing I will say about the OGA is that it had a lot of complaints about the hardware build quality. In particular, a lot of people didn't like the feel of the controls. Now fast forward to later in 2020, this guy appeared. This is the Ambernic RG351P. Now this is a clone of the Odroid Go Advance, the exact same hardware inside, but they did make a couple upgrades, for example dual analog stick controls, and also an OCA laminated LCD panel. And so this did have a lot of upgrades over the OGA, but also was a little bit more expensive. It was about $110 when it first came out in September of 2020. And in addition, there were some things that were a little bit less than stellar on this handheld. Number one, it didn't have Wi-Fi, and it also had a 3x2 aspect ratio with a little bit of a lower resolution. This made it really good for Game Boy Advance emulation, but all the other systems were a bit of a compromise. Either way, the RG351P was a huge success, and it inspired Ambernic to make other devices with the same chipset, but with different form factors. And so a few months later, the next one they made was called the RG351M. Now this one is almost a dead ringer for the RG351P, but it's got a couple upgrades. For example, it has a metal shell which gives it a nice sturdy feel and it also came with built-in Wi-Fi. Now other than that there is no upgrades to this device so same chip and same screen all that same experience but just with a little bit more of a premium quality to it. All the same at this point a lot of people were asking for a more traditional 480p or 4x3 aspect ratio display and sure enough a few months later they created their next device which is the Ambernic RG351V. Now V stands for vertical, as you can tell this one is of a Game Boy design, and this is also the first Ambernic device with a wood panel design to it. So either way, this was the first Game Boy style Ambernic device that they released, and this was back in like March of 2021. And thankfully this one did have that 4x3 aspect ratio display with a 480p resolution. And this kind of set the stage for a lot of other handhelds within this chipset to release with this screen as well. Overall, I like this device a lot. It had built-in Wi-Fi, and the controls were okay, if not a little bit cramped, just by virtue of being a vertical. Either way, for Christmas of 21, this is actually the device that I gave out to all my friends because I thought it was the best one available at the time. But still, there was a segment of people, myself included, that wanted a 480p display but with a horizontal handheld. And sure enough, in September of 21, Ambernic released their next handheld, which was the RG351MP. I still don't really know what the M and the P are supposed to stand for, but either way, this is a device that's kind of a Frankenstein of all the others that they had released within this chipset. So number one, it was a metal device, and I really liked the blue color option that they had here. In addition, they had upgraded the screen to that 480p resolution. Now bear in mind, this is still the same RK3326 chipset that we've seen in all these other devices, but either way, this one seemed to be the definitive version of all those handhelds. There is only one feature that this device really lacked, and that unfortunately was the built-in Wi-Fi. I think a lot of this had to do with the metal shell that they used here, maybe they weren't getting a good Wi-Fi signal, but either way, that was the one compromise that I found on this device 
device that kept it from being kind of perfect at that time. So in the end, this is the last RK3326 device that Ambernic released back in September of 21. However, at the same time, there were other companies also making other clones of the Odroigo Advance. And the most prolific among them was Pow Kitty. Now I'm not going to show off all the devices that they released, there's a ton of them there, but I would say that their most significant release at the time was actually the RGB20S that you see right here. Now you might be familiar with this device already because it kind of had a viral moment last year in 2022 on TikTok. In fact, this device was a huge success because of that viral exposure. Now for me personally, I was kind of lukewarm on it. I thought that the controls here were pretty lousy and I thought that the ergonomics were also pretty darn uncomfortable. And so I did a review of this and basically nothing else about it. Now the interesting thing about the RGB20S is that it's actually a clone of the Ambernic RG351 MP. That's the blue metal device we were just looking at. And so as a result of basically copying those hardware internals, you're able to use the SD cards from the 351 MP in this device as well. And so it was a little bit ironic that a clone of a clone here in the RGB20S ended up being the most successful RK3326 device in terms of sales. However, it had nothing to do with the retro handheld community. It was just people on TikTok seeing it and then buying it. Either way, that success then spurred on a couple other clones from there. And probably the most prominent among them is this one here called the R35S. This one came out earlier this year and is a direct clone of the Pow Kitty RGB20S we were just looking at. Now I picked this one up about four or five months ago and I gotta say that I ended up not making a review on it at all. And that's because the controls on this device were absolutely terrible. The rubber membranes they're using below the D-pad and the face buttons are just terrible. They are completely stiff. And so as a result, it's just a lot of work to push down on these buttons to the point where it's not enjoyable. In fact, I could never play more than a few minutes at a time before I just wanted to throw this thing across the room. And so as a result, I just kind of gave up on the whole thing and didn't review this device at all. Regardless, it was actually a pretty big success because it was very cheap. I think it was something like $35 or $40. And either way, it was definitely successful enough to inspire that company to make another clone. And this one is the device we're reviewing here today. And so here is the R36S. This one has the exact same chipset as all the other devices we were just looking at, and is a direct clone of the RGB20S, which is a clone of the RG351MP, which in turn is a clone of the Odrego Advance. And so that's the long and storied history of how we're seeing this device here today. Now the reason why I was drawn to making a review of this is just how cheap it is. For example, if you look on AliExpress right now, you can usually find it for about $40. And depending on the holiday sales that you might find for the next couple months, Months, you might be able to pick it up for even cheaper. Either way, I'm going to consider this a $40 handheld, which is just really surprising for me even to say with this chipset. For example, if you try to get another RK3326 device from Pow Kitty or Ambernic, they're still charging around $80 each for them. And so this one is essentially half that price. And so now let's take a look and see whether or not that discount is really going to be worth it for picking it up. So let's go ahead and start with the unboxing. And I got to say that the box here is actually pretty well designed. It comes in three different colors. There's a solid white and then transparent black and transparent purple. And as you can see, I got the transparent black one. Now inside the box, it's very bare bones. You've got one charging cable and then a quick start manual. And this will just basically show you what the buttons are and what they will do. And just to show you how shameless of a copy this is, you can see even on the manual, it says RGB20S. Bear in mind, that's the name of a console from a completely different company. That's just crazy. Anyway, first impressions of the device, I think it's very sharp looking. I like the fact that the analog sticks are below the D-pad and face buttons, because when they're centered like this, that does mean they're going to be a little bit more comfortable. One thing that's also unique about this device is that it has a battery compartment. So you could open it up and change it out if it ever dies. Now there's no labeling on the battery itself, so I'm not really sure what to say other than the fact that it's 3500 milliamp hours. And of note, I got about four hours gameplay time when I was doing all my testing throughout the week. Also of note, the compartment here is actually very firmly in place so it doesn't rattle or shake around. Now on a lot of these vertical clone handhelds, the back buttons are super loud, but these are actually dampened pretty well. They're definitely not quiet by any means, but let me give you a listen right here. So I think overall that's pretty acceptably loud for me, I got no major complaints. 
Now let's take a look at the rest of the device, starting with the left side. Here we've got a power and reset button, and then also an SD card slot, which will be where you put your games. Of note, even the cheapest base model will still come with a 64 gigabyte card that's going to be preloaded with a bunch of different ROMs. Now on the right side, we have our system card hidden behind a quality control sticker, and then also our volume up and down buttons. So now let's take a look at the controls here on the front of the device. We'll start with the D-pad. I will say that the rubber membrane here is a lot softer than it was on the R35S. In fact, when pushing on the cardinal points, it's pretty solid and has a nice responsive feel to it. And so I think they greatly improved the controls here to give it a more retro kind of classic feel. However, one thing I noticed when trying to rock the D-pad around into diagonals, it didn't have a very good pivot. Instead, it just kind of has a flat feeling to it when you press from the center and then try to roll it around. So already, I'm a little bit concerned about that, so let's do a couple D-pad tests right now. As always, we're going to start with the Contra test, so I'm going to push down on the D-pad and then rock it left and right. And what I'm trying to see here is whether or not the character will move a little bit. I want a little bit of movement, but not a ton. And you can see here that the character is basically not moving at all. And I would say this is the result of not having a very good pivot. What's happening here is that there's a little piece of plastic at the bottom of the D-pad, and it kind of centers the D-pad and then also acts like an anchor. And it feels like that piece of plastic is a little bit too short, which means that it's not anchored very well and you're not going to be able to pivot. And so as a result, even though it is pretty easy to hit the cardinal points of up, down, left, and right, it's pretty hard to hit the diagonals. And that is definitely something that I found when trying to play Contra. I could shoot left and right no problem, but when I tried to shoot down or up at an angle, it did take some deliberate effort, a little bit more than I would like. Another test of diagonals is going to be Street Fighter games. So here is Street Fighter 3 Third Strike. And for this, I'm doing what I call the Hadouken ability and Shoryuken ability test. And by trying to do the fireballs and dragon punches, I can usually get a feel of whether or not the diagonals are going to be pretty easy to hit. And definitely from my brief testing, there is a bit of a problem here in the fact that it is pretty hard to hit those diagonals. So I was getting about a 50% success rate here with both Hadoukens and Shoryukens. So in the end, I would say this D-pad is serviceable. It's not great, but there's definitely going to be certain games where you're going to wish that you could hit the diagonals a little bit more easily. So overall, I would say I'd give it maybe a 5 or a 6 out of 10. It's not the worst in the world, and it's certainly an improvement over its predecessor, but it's definitely not in the league of something like an Amronic or even a Pow Kitty device. Next, let's take a look at the face buttons. Now, these have also been improved. I think they're probably using the same softer membrane. In fact, they're actually very nice and responsive. They have a little bit of a mushy quality to them, but still will bounce up pretty quickly. So really no major complaints when it comes to the face buttons at all. Next up, we have the function buttons here in the center. Now, these have a clicky micro switch connection to them, and they are a bit on the loud side, and they also are pretty loose in the shell, so they kind of slide around within there. However, I was surprised to find that when shaking it, it actually didn't rattle as much as I thought it would. So let's do a quick sound test here of the buttons and then a shake test. Yeah, overall, I think that's actually pretty good. It doesn't rattle as much as I was expecting. And finally, we have the analog sticks. Now, these are Nintendo Switch Joy-Con style sticks, and they feel fine. They're a little bit stiff, but the more I used them, they kind of loosened up a bit. And yeah, I think they're going to be okay. And they do click down for L3 and R3, so we have full functionality. Now, looking at the bottom, we have two different USB-C ports. One is called OTG. That's going to be for external controllers. And then the one called DC is where you're going to charge the handheld. And between the two, you have a headphone jack, and then also you've got two holes that looks like they're for speakers. But bear in mind, there are no speakers on the bottom of this device. We just have one single speaker right here front and center. And we'll do a sound test here in a moment. Now, in terms of just overall ergonomics and feel, I think it's a pretty comfortable handheld because the D-pad and the face buttons are centered. It's a bit squarish in design, but I kind of like that classic feel to it. And so the vibe here is very late 90s and early 2000s for me, and I kind of like that. Next, let's take a look at this screen. Now, this is an OCA laminated IPS panel with a 640 by 480 resolution. And I gotta say, it does look pretty good. One thing of note is that the screen itself does sit out a bit from the case. And I always love the way that these screens will pop out of the device like this, but it also will make it a little bit prone to falling out of the case every once in a while. Now, I haven't heard any reports of that happening happening with this device in particular, but it is something worth noting. Now let's do a couple size comparisons. We're going to start with the RG351V, considering that this was the first 480p 3.5 inch display that we found with this chipset. 
And right off the bat, you can see that the R36S is actually quite a bit smaller. Not only are the bezels smaller, but the device itself is just a little bit more compact. And so between the two, I think there are some pretty nice improvements on the R36S, at least in terms of ergonomics and design. But all the same, if you don't have the 351V, you may not know what this size really means. And so let's take a look at some other vertical handhelds. We'll start with the OG. So here is the DMG Game Boy, as well as the Game Boy Color. And you can see that in terms of height, it's about the same size as the Game Boy Color, but a little bit wider. And of course, all around, it's much smaller than the original Game Boy. Next, let's take a look at those clone devices. So the RGB20S on the right, and then the R35S on the left. And you can see this one is quite a bit taller than the other two, but about the same width. And honestly, I like the height here. I think it does give it a little bit more of an ergonomic feel. Here's a couple other vertical devices, starting on the left with the XU10. I just reviewed this device about a week ago, and I really liked it, but it is a lot more expensive. This one's about $70 altogether. And then finally on the right, we have the Ambernic RG353V. This one has the Rock Chip 3566 chip inside, so it is quite a bit more powerful. But you can see in terms of just design and look, it's actually pretty similar between the two. Next, here's a comparison against some of these smaller vertical handhelds. These two are the darlings of the retro handheld scene this year. We have the Ambernic RG35XX on the left, and then the Miu Mini Plus on the right. Now, I would say these two devices are a lot more pocketable, but these two are nowhere near as powerful as the R36S. They'll basically cap out at around PS1, whereas the R36S is going to play a lot more systems, which we'll demonstrate here later in the video. So in the end, yeah, there's a lot of variance between sizes when it comes to vertical handhelds, but I guess you could say it's somewhere between the size of a Miu Mini and an analog pocket. So it's just kind of there in the middle, and I think it's a really good place to be. I'm not sure if this was something that everyone would consider to be pocketable, but it's definitely something that I could probably grab and take around with me on travel or something like that. Either way, let's go ahead and start it up and have a look at what software we're working with here with the stock operating system. And like I mentioned, bear in mind that this will come preloaded with a 64 gigabyte card full of games. And so here we are, it looks like they're running a version of Arc OS. And I've also seen this theme before, it's called Nintendo Switch theme, and I'll show you here in a second how to change this out if you want something a little bit more traditional. Either way, the initial experience is going to be that you can just navigate through your systems, pick your games by pressing the A button, and then start it right up. And it does look like some of these games do not have box art scraped for it, while others do. And if we press the start button to bring up the emulation station menu, you can see here at the bottom it is running Arc OS 2.0, and it looks like they're using a very old build. It is dated from April of 2022. While we're in here, let me go ahead and show you how to change out the theme. We're going to go up here into UI settings, and then under theme, we've got a bunch of different options. My favorite with Arc OS is NES Box, and so that's the one I'm going to set here, and yeah, I think it looks pretty good. While we're in here, I'm going to go into the display settings as well, and then go and turn down the brightness just to make it a little bit easier on the eyes as we record. Now the next thing I wanted to do is update this version of ArcOS because it's about a year and a half old at this point. However, I'd heard this device does not have built-in Wi-Fi, so we can check that pretty quickly by going into the options and then under Wi-Fi. You can see they already have a couple networks listed, but these are like the factory defaults, so we need to delete these. And then we can go ahead and search for our own. However, when searching for a network, nothing came up. So this does not have an internal Wi-Fi. However, I do have a USB Wi-Fi dongle, which has worked with ArcOS previously. So I'm going to plug this into a USB-C adapter and then try that scan again. And yeah, sure enough, it showed a bunch of my networks, including my own. And I was able to insert my password and get connected. However, I found that once I left the menu, I was not able to actually connect to the Wi-Fi at all. And I'm not sure what's going on here that makes it drop the connection, because on other devices, this usually isn't a problem at all. I think what it may be is actually a power issue with the OTG port, in that it will initialize that USB dongle at first, and then it'll just cut it off after a moment. Because no matter what I tried, I couldn't maintain that connection. And as a result, unfortunately, I was not able to update the operating system, at least over Wi-Fi. However, after doing a little bit of investigating and pulling out the system card, I found that it's the most generic of generic SD cards. It doesn't have a label on it at all. And so my guess here is that this thing will probably fail over time because they're using basically the cheapest thing they could. By the way, when looking at the games card, it also is unlabeled, but at least it does say 64 gigabytes. Anyway, what we're going to do now is we're going to flash the most recent version of ArcOS onto a brand new SD card. This will give us a much more stable experience and we'll be running the latest version of ArcOS. 
Now, I have a full ArcOS starter guide that I released earlier this year available on my website, and I also made a whole video walkthrough as well, so I'm going to leave that all linked below so that we don't have to retread all of that again. But all the same, let me give you a quick walkthrough of what that experience is going to be like because it is pretty easy. Number one, we need to go to the ArcOS website and then scroll all the way down until we find the different builds that we have available of this operating system. And you can see they actually have an R35S build right here, but as you can see, it says that it's the original stock operating system, which means it's probably going to be from April of 2022. And of note, the developer does say that you should update it via Wi-Fi. And given the fact that I was having issues setting that up, we're going to try a different route. If you remember, the RGB20S, which is what this device is cloned after, is a clone of the RG351MP. And it just so happens the RG351MP is a much more recent version. It actually was last updated in September of this year. So that's the version we're going to download. We're going to grab the 351MP one because it's the most recent update. And then also one other thing of note is I found that I needed to change out one boot file to make sure that it worked. And I'll update my ArcOS starter guide on my website so that you can find all these links down below. Either way, I pull this directly from the developer's GitHub, and that's the other file that we need to download besides the operating system itself. And once we have those two files downloaded, as you can see here, we are ready to go. First thing, we're going to insert that new SD card into our computer, and then we're going to use an app called Belena Etcher to flash the operating system onto the SD card. Again, I'll have all this stuff linked and explained in the ArcOS guide linked down below. Regardless, we're going to pick flash from file, then pick our ArcOS file, and then make sure that it's selected your SD card and you can press the flash button. It's going to ask, do you really want to do it? You're going to say, yeah, man, I want to do it. And then it's going to take a few minutes to flash ArcOS to that card. Once it's done, you're going to get a bunch of pop-ups and it's going to make you think that you broke your computer. And don't worry about it. Just go ahead and cancel out of all these pop-ups that show up. And once they're done, Belen Etcher will actually eject the SD card. So what you need to do now is actually reach over, pull the card out of your computer, and then plug it back in. Now, once you do that, you're probably going to get all these same pop-ups again. Don't worry, you didn't break your computer. Just go ahead and cancel out of all of them one more time. Now there's a couple partitions for this card, but the one that we're looking for is called boot. And so just make sure that you leave that window open and we're ready to move over that one boot file that we also downloaded. Now before we do that, we need to actually take it and save it to our computer just in case something goes wrong. And this is the file right here. It says RK3326 RG351MP Linux DTB. So all you have to do is just drag this over to your computer so that you save a copy and then open up the zip file of the other one that we downloaded. You'll find a DTB with the exact same file name there. Go ahead and drag this over onto the SD card. It's going to ask, what do you want to do here? Because it has a file already named that. Go ahead and press replace. And that's it. We are good to go. You basically just hacked the mainframe and got this all working. So let's eject the SD card. And now we're going to put it back into our device. Now in that first initial boot up, it's going to take a minute. It's going to basically initialize all of the partitions. But after a couple minutes, you'll be good to go with a fresh new version of ArcOS on the latest release for this chipset. Now at first, even if you have your games card in the device, it's not going to actually pick up on them. What you have to do first is go into options, then select switch to SD2 for ROMs. Now I took the game card out of my device, so I'm going to put it back in right now. And then we're going to press the A button to start this process. It'll again take a couple minutes, but after it's done, it will now read all of your cards from the second SD card slot. And so there we go. We now have the most recent version of ArcOS running on our device with all of the games that came with it. Now, if you want to dive into the weeds and learn a little bit more about ArcOS and how to tweak all of the settings, then I would recommend that starter guide I mentioned before. And one of the other important factors here is that you can add your own second SD card and your own ROM files. That'll definitely give you the best experience. However, just to keep this video simple, we're going to stick with the card that came with the device. And so let me scroll through here just to give you an idea of all the different systems that are going to be supported on that 64 gig by card. And as you can tell, yeah, there's a bunch on here. In fact, there are thousands of games for some of these systems. For example, with Super Nintendo alone, you can see there are over 1300 games. So no matter what crazy obscure game you played on the Super Nintendo as a kid, it is probably going to be on this list. Now, personally, I would recommend going and taking that SD card, putting it into your computer, and then deleting the games that you know you're never going to play. Because personally, I think that having 1300 Super Nintendo games probably means you're going to spend more time scrolling than actually playing. Either way, all that's going to be detailed in my ArcOS guide if you want to learn more. For now, let's just go ahead and start doing some game testing to let you know what kind of experience you're going to get. I'm going to start with a quick sound test. Bear in mind, we only have a single mono speaker right here in the center, and this is going to be at full volume. Honestly, I think the sound here is pretty good, especially at this price point. 
It does get nice and loud, and all the different parts of the soundstage are easy to hear. So really no complaints when it comes to the audio quality overall. Now let's start moving through our system, starting with the easiest to play games and then moving our way up. Starting with Game Boy and Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance, all these systems are going to play at 100% speed, absolutely no problem here. And like I mentioned, the stock card is going to have thousands of these games, so anything that you can think of playing will already be on this device ready to go. Same thing when you get to the home console systems, so Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, all these are going to run really well, and the catalogs here are going to be quite comprehensive. However, one thing to bear in mind, with these preloaded cards, it is very much so a double-edged sword. Even though yes, many of these games are going to be loaded up on here, some of them may not be the versions that you're expecting. For example, they might be in a different language, or often the manufacturers won't realize it and they'll put a bunch of ROM hacks inside. This game right here, Super Punch-Out, is a good example on Super Nintendo. From the moment I started the match, I had my super power bar at the bottom completely filled up, and even if I got hit, I didn't lose any health or any of that power gauge. And in the regular game, that's not supposed to happen. So this is like a cheated or hacked version of the game. And while it is pretty cool to just basically cruise through the entire game, I bet that's probably not the experience you're hoping for when you're trying to relive those like childhood moments. And so I would very much so recommend that you add your own games. Obviously, I'm not going to tell you how to do that because you're on your own to find them, but it is going to give you a more curated and personalized experience. Either way, let's go ahead and move on and test out these other systems, starting with Arcade next. Now, when it comes to Arcade, many games are going to play just fine. In fact, all of your 80s classics, early 90s, and even some mid-90s games will play just fine. Basically all the way up to the CPS3 or Street Fighter 3 catalog. And this is one of those systems where you'll probably be using the analog stick a lot. And it does work okay, it's not the same as an arcade joystick, but all the same it'll work fine. In addition to your traditional arcade games, you can also play the full Neo Geo catalog here, absolutely no problem, these games will all play at full speed. Another system that'll play at full speed with no problem is going to be the original Sony PlayStation. No matter what game you throw at it, the RK3326 chip is just more than enough for it. So even the heavy hitting games like Bloody Roar 2, Tekken 3, yeah, they're going to be just fine. Now in terms of power, Nintendo DS games will also play very well here. So if you have any favorite DS games that work really well with traditional controls, that's going to be great. Bear in mind this device does not have a touch screen, and by virtue of this smaller screen, you are going to have a bit of a hit and miss experience. When you're playing a game that only requires you to see one screen at a time, it's no problem. But if there's a game that has, for example, a map on the other screen, it can get a little bit annoying. Grand Theft Auto Chinatown Wars is a great example here. When you're driving around, it looks really great just to see your car on the street, but the map is on the other screen, so you have to swap between the two by pressing L2 and R2, and that can be a very jarring experience when you're actually trying to drive. In fact, I hit a bunch of pedestrians on accident just trying to drive to my uncle's restaurant. So something to bear in mind is yes, Nintendo DS games will play, but it may not be as great of an experience as you were hoping. Next, let's move over to the systems that will struggle on this device. And we'll start with Nintendo 64. Now, by default, ArcOS is running the RetroArch emulator. And as you can see, many games are going to struggle. Here's a worst case scenario with Cruising USA. This one runs at about half speed using the default RetroArch core. Now, in my ArcOS guide, I show how to change out the emulators to get better performance, specifically with this system. And so often, using the standalone emulator options will give you a better performance. Personally, I like to use the Mupin standalone one with the Rice graphic backend. It's not going to make every single game run at full speed, but it is going to give you better performance. Now, unfortunately, this emulator will not show you the frames per second on screen, so I can't really say what is actually getting you. But I will say that maybe half the Nintendo 64 catalog will be at least somewhat playable, as long as you're okay with some slowdown here and there. And it's a similar story with Sega Dreamcast. This one actually runs the best with the RetroArch emulator, but the thing is here, you have to kind of pay attention to the frames per second. Because this emulator will use a frame skip, and so anything above 30 frames per second will actually feel fairly smooth. However, anytime it drops below 30 frames per second, you will definitely feel and hear that slowdown. Now, with a lot of lightweight or 2D based games, it'll be just fine, but some of the more heavy hitting games like Dead or Alive 2 or Crazy Taxi 2, yeah, these unfortunately are not going to play at full speed. They're actually pretty close, but still they will dip down to under 30 frames per second, which will compromise your overall experience. So again, I think that Dreamcast is kind of going to be like Nintendo 64 in that, yeah, maybe half the games are going to be okay as long as you're okay with a little bit of slowdown here and there. Next up, we have Sony PSP. This performance is going to be a little bit worse. I would say maybe a third of games are going to play okay, and you're going to want to focus on things like 2D and fighting games because these are a little bit easier to run. I think in particular when it comes to like arcade racing games, you know, Ridge Racer, Outrun, and then those heavyweight 3D action games like God of War, those aren't really going to play. 
But all the same, as long as you're okay with 2D games and maybe some role-playing games, those will be pretty good on the PSP. When it comes down to it, all three of these systems, Nintendo 64 and Dreamcast and PSP, are probably not worth buying this device specifically for, but instead I would think of it like a nice bonus where some of these games will actually play pretty well. Now before we wrap up, I wanted to say that there is one other recent update to ArcOS that is really going to make it worth upgrading for. And the feature is called Quick Mode. You can enable it by going into Options and then selecting the third option which says Enable Quick Mode. This again will take a minute and it will show a bunch of code, but once it's done you are good to go. Now anytime you're playing a game that's using the RetroArch backend, anytime you want to shut down the device immediately, you can press and hold the R3 button and then press the Power button. After a moment, it's actually going to save your game and then power the device down. Now anytime you want to jump back into the game, all you have to do is just turn it on. And from here, RetroArch is going to start up, but it's also going to remember what game you were playing before. Not only that, it's going to remember exactly where you were in the game and load up that specific spot. And it's a fairly quick process. It takes a little bit less than 17 seconds to go from off to on back in your game. Now, ArcOS also has a sleep mode. So if you want to tap on the power button anytime you're playing a game, it'll go into sleep. But bear in mind that this will drain your battery over time. So I would use the sleep mode if you're going to leave it for an hour or two. But if you want to power it down, I would recommend using that quick mode. It's been really handy for me. Anyway, I think that's enough testing for now. Let's go ahead and jump into what I like and what I don't like about the R36S. And of course, number one is going to be that sticker price. I cannot believe this device is only $40 and sometimes less. And not only is this a very affordable price, but there's also some good features to this handheld as well. For example, I think the controls are decent. They are definitely not the best, but they get the job done. I also think it has an excellent screen. It's nice and bright, the colors are very accurate, and I love the way that it just really kind of pops out of the case. It looks very good. In terms of comfort, it's probably not the best device in the world, but all the same, I still found it to be very comfortable even for extended use periods. Another thing I really like about this device is how versatile it is. If you want, you can treat the R36S as a plug-and-play handheld. Once it arrives, you can turn it on and immediately start playing games. However, if you want to dive into the world of retro handhelds, this thing is also very friendly for custom firmware. Not only can you update ArcOS to work on it, but there are other custom firmwares that'll work too, including Amber Elect. So there's really just a whole world that'll open up for you at the $40 price point, and that's pretty crazy. Now, of course, this device is not perfect, so there are a couple things I don't like about it. Let's go into those. Number one, I'm not a huge fan of the pivot on the D-pad. For me, I found it a little bit too low, which made it hard to press diagonals. I don't think it was so bad to completely disrupt my gameplay experience, but it definitely wasn't the best out there. In terms of performance, there are some systems that won't play well, and that's just by virtue of the chipset we're using in here. And so as I expected, the Nintendo 64 Dreamcast and PSP performance is not that great. If anything, as long as you're okay with playing lightweight and 2D games, you might be surprised. And I should also mention that Sega Saturn will work on this device as well. It works pretty well on ArcOS. However, the 64GB card that comes with it did not have any Sega Saturn games on it, so you'll have to load your own. Another thing that kind of left me scratching my head is the wonky Wi-Fi. Even though I used an adapter that should work with ArcOS, I didn't have any luck when connecting. And so it does make me think that there's some sort of power management issue happening with the OTG port. But either way, manually upgrading is relatively easy. And finally, the last point here is there are many other better options out there. And that's really just a byproduct of the fact that retro handhelds have been getting very popular over these past couple years. And so if you are just generally in the market for a retro handheld, I think there are many other things that you could buy. But I would say that at $40, there's nothing really out there that can compete in terms of performance and quality here compared to the R36S. And I really do want to reiterate, this thing is $40 with free shipping. That's pretty crazy. For example, just kind of close your eyes and think about what $40 will get you at the end of 2023. A quick example would be this game right here, Pups and Purrs Pet Shop on the Nintendo Switch. Now, I don't know anything about this game, and I'm not trying to rag on it too much, but it only has two reviews on Best Buy, and the average here is 3.0. And even though I've never played this game, I can bet all the money in the world that the $40 you would spend in getting this game is not going to be as fun as the $40 dollars you would get when buying the R36S. Just off the top of my head, this is probably going to give you access to about eight or 10,000 games right out the gate, and obviously you can also add your own. On top of that, we've got some pretty impressive build quality for the price, and a screen that's a lot better than you would expect at $40. So I guess here's the way I see it. If you're looking to get your very first handheld and you don't really want to break the bank, 
And if you're in a $40 budget, then yes, I think the R36S is really good. Now, if you want to go up even a little bit more to 50, 60 and beyond, you will definitely get some better experiences out there. But as it stands for $40, I was completely amazed at what I got here with the R36S. It's certainly not a perfect handheld and it's not one that I probably will play very often, but that's because I have many other devices that I can play instead. The way I'm looking at it is that this is probably going to be a very good entry level handheld. And I think that at the $40 price point and makes for a pretty good gift as well. I think if you handed this to somebody who didn't know anything about retro game emulation, they would think you spent way more than $40 giving them this experience. Anyway, let me know what you think down in the comments below. Is this something that you're interested in picking up at this price point, or do you think it's worth saving your money to get something a little bit better? As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.